this morning, we have an outstanding speaker, and I'm delighted to see that so many people have chosen to join us for that. To introduce our speaker, I have uh, one of the University of San Diego's favorite sons, and I think you'll enjoy his presentation as well. Uh, you may know that WD-40 is a company that has excelled in the marketplace on the strength of its product as well as on the strength of its brand. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a key part of WD-40's brand, its CEO, Gary Rich. through two days of the MSEL program with a great class and you're all doing the clips today. What some fantastic learning you've had. But we've got a gift this morning and um, the gift is uh, Marshall Goldsmith. Marshall is rated as one of the top five business coach coaches in the USA. Uh, his book that we study in our program, What Got You Here, Won't Get You There, uh, is um, his 28th book, I believe. Um, it won the award last year for the uh, Harold Longman Award for the Best Business Book. It's been number two or three on the bestseller list. And his new book, Mojo, that just came out a couple of weeks ago, I think is number three today on the Wall Street Journal. Yes. And was number two last week on the USA Today because everyone was buying Harry Paulson's book. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why anybody would buy it. I'd be blessed to have had spend some time with Marshall. Uh, he makes a difference. I'm glad that he could come today. I'm glad that he's a friend of ours. And Marshall, we are delighted that you're going to come and rev us up. Now, we had about 35 minutes with him already this morning. I've got to tell you, he's had no cough. <laughs> <laughs> so, a great pleasure. And please welcome Dr. Marshall. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. My name is Marshall Goldsmith. Can everyone hear me okay? Well, first, uh, we're going to spend about an hour. And then if anybody wants to stick around afterwards, I'll stick around, answer questions, sign books, anything else that you like to do after that. I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm from Kentucky. I went to school in Indiana. I got a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor. I was a dean. And for 32 years, I've been doing executive education. So I do three things. One is, I like today, I give talks or teach classes. This is the most fun part of my job. So this is what I enjoy doing the most. Two is, I do executive coaching. And that is what I'm most famous for. And my clients are CEOs, or could be CEOs, of multi-billion dollar companies. If you look at my book, they're kind enough to write their names in the book, so you know who many of my clients are. And then the third thing I do is write and edit books and articles. So uh, you know, very nice that my new book, is, that book that you have has been translated into, I believe, 28 languages. And so it's a bestseller all around the world. So it's been real, real nice. So and, and again, after writing all those books, it's nice to write one that someone bought. This is good, right? <laughs> now, what are we going to be doing today? First, we're going to talk about how to use what to stop in personal development and coaching. We're going to practice something called feed forward. My programs are very interactive and a model you can use to develop yourself and help others develop. We're going to cover a lot of material in a very short period of time. We're going to start right now with peer coaching. I love peer coaching. It's the future of coaching. UC Berkeley, the Haas Business School, is doing a peer coaching program with their fully employed MBAs. The results for people that have peer coaches are just as good as results for people that have fancy executive coaches. And, and what I like about peer coaching is you can do it with anybody, just any person you want to be around who has no vested interest, who wants to help you, and you enjoy being with. Doesn't require any kind of special qualifications. And I do this myself, so it's not just something I'm preaching at others. I also have a peer coach. We're going to start right now. Look around the room. Find someone you do not know very well to be your peer coach. Sit, stand up, sit next to that person. Go, find someone you don't know to be your coach. Go, 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 go. <laughs> we all need a coach. OK. Find a partner. OK, go. Sit by your partner. Sit by your partner. Sit by your partner. OK, sit down. Sit down by your partner. Find a seat. Sit by your partner. Sit down together. Sit by your partner. OK, sit by your partner. Does everybody have a partner? OK, good. Sit down. Sit by your partner. OK, stop. Stop, stop. We all need a partner. In peer coaching, you're not here to put your partner down. You're not here to critique your partner. You're here to help your partner. Shake hands with your partner and say, partner, my name is. I'm here to help. Go, 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 go.
Now, I was asked by a member of the class, what was my inspiration for writing the book? What got you here won't get you there. Part of it came from a comment made by Peter Drucker. I had the privilege of spending 50 days with Peter Drucker before he died, world's greatest authority on management. He said, we spend a lot of time helping leaders learn what to do. We don't spend enough time helping leaders learn what to stop. And that one comment kind of led to my book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And so that's one of the things we're going to talk about today, how to use what to stop. And again, did you notice I, I tried to meet as many of you as I could before the program began. I didn't meet all of you. I tried. There was a reason. I was looking into your eyes. I was looking for signs of disease. <laughs> and yes, I think I found many of the problems I'm going to discuss in the very faces of the people in this room. Now, I was interviewed in the Harvard Business Review and asked a question, what is the number one problem of the successful people you work with? And the answer is winning too much. What does that mean? If it's important, we want to win. Critical, we want to win. Trivial, we want to win. Not worth it, we want to win anyway. Winners like to win. Now, the people in this room are winners. You're very successful at what you do. The problem is winners like to win, and it's very hard for winners not to constantly go through life winning. I'm going to give you a case study that 75% of my successful clients fail, and most of you will fail this case study. When I say fail, they fail themselves. Now, you were foolish enough to bring your husband to this with you, right? Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> a very dubious move on your part, right? <laughs> Are you ready? You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, partner, friend, or significant other wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have a heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. Food tastes awful. Service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided had only they listened to me, me, me. Option B, shut up. <laughs> Eat the stupid food. Try to enjoy it and have a nice evening. What would I do? What should I do? 75% of my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. How many people in the room, please raise your hands, have ever critiqued the food before? Raise your hands. Come on, come on, raise your hands. Yes. Now, by the way, was this smart or stupid? It was stupid. It was very stupid. <laughs> and as stupid as that was, yes, I'm going to give you an example now that is so hideously stupid. It will make that one pale by comparison. And how many of you are in this fine program where you work full time and go to school as well? Oh, yes. Then I will predict near certain failure for all of you. Are you ready? You have a hard day at work. A hard day. Such a hard day. And then you have to go to school. And the teachers, they want you to read things, and they're terrible. And you come home, and your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today. I had such a tough day. And we reply, you had a hard day. <laughs> you had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We are so competitive, we have to prove we are more miserable than the people we live with. <laughs> so I gave this example at one class. A man in the back raised his hand, and he said, I did that last week. I asked him what happened. He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It's not over. <laughs> now, next classic problem of successful people. Didn't this come in first place, Gary, in the class in terms of the biggest problem? Adding too much value. And you notice that when I was speaking to the group. Do you notice that? I told the group, just say thank you. Did they have a tendency to say thank you or keep babbling? <laughs> Lots of babbling, right? Even you, I noticed, do this, right? <laughs> Adding too much value. Thank you. <laughs> Incredibly difficult for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life adding value. What does this mean? I'm young, smart, enthusiastic. I come to you with an idea. You think it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our natural tendency is to say, that's a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? The problem is the quality of the idea may go up 5%. My commitment to executing the idea may go down 50%. It's no longer my idea. Incredibly difficult for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life adding value. One of my coaching clients recently retired. His name is J.P. Garnier. J.P. was the CEO of a large drug company, GlaxoSmithKline. I asked J.P., what did you learn about leadership as the CEO of this company? He said, I learned a very hard lesson. And every time you get promoted, you need to understand this lesson. My suggestions become orders. Every time you get promoted, that lesson becomes more and more true. My suggestions become orders. He said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they are orders. If I do not want them to be orders, they're orders anyway. 
my suggestions become orders. I teach in the new admiral program for the last seven years for the United States Navy. What is the first thing I teach the new admirals when they get that star? Your suggestions become orders. Have any of you been in the military? Do admirals make suggestions? No. An admiral makes a suggestion, what's the response? Sir, yes, sir. Admirals don't make suggestions. Admirals give orders. I asked JP, what did you learn from me when I was your coach? He said, you taught me one lesson that helped me be a better CEO and have a happier life. I said, what was the lesson? He said, before I speak, stop and breathe. And he asked one question, is it worth it? And he said, as CEO of the, this big company, 50% of the time, if I had the discipline to stop and to breathe and ask myself, is it worth it? What did I decide? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? No. Everyone look up here. Let's all take a deep breath. Ah, let's all think back to the last time you got into a heated argument with someone you love, when you had a need to win and prove they were wrong on a minor or insignificant point. Have any of us ever done this before? Was it worth it? Do any of you have teenage children? Have we ever attempted to prove the teenage child was wrong on a minor or insignificant point? How well did that work out? Not so good. <laughs> no, 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 no. Win the big things. All those little things, just take a deep breath and let go. Yes? It's so important, but. Did so you hear the word? Oh, oh, okay, good. You can't hear me. Uh oh. Can you hear me better now? Yes. What's your first name? Karen, can you hear me? <laughs> Karen, can you see me? <laughs> Is this better? Yes. Left a good job in the city. <laughs> Okay, moving on. Next classic disease, telling the world how smart we really are. It's very hard for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life telling the world how smart, successful, experienced, and wonderful we really are. How many of you remember when you were kids, mommy and daddy saying, when I was a little boy, when I was a little girl? How many of you heard your parents say these words? Were you impressed? How many of us as parents have noticed these same idiotic words leaping from our own mouths as we speak to our children? And do they care? No, they give you this blank look like, shut up, you know, who cares, right? Next, I already knew that. Very hard for somebody to tell us something we already know without us pointing out we already know it. I'm young, smart, enthusiastic, I come to you with an idea. You think it's a great idea, you already knew it. Next time, just say great idea. Just say great idea. We don't have to prove we know more than everybody else. And then finally, four words to be a better coach. What are these four words? Help more, judge less. Now, by the way, these four words don't just apply at work, they apply at home. How many of us have friends and family members who might be happy if we helped just a little bit more and judged just a tad less? Would any of them object to these changes? Would any of them a year from today come back and say, we miss the judgmental you? <laughs> <laughs> very, un your, your wife is laughing. <laughs> no, very unlikely that's going to happen. Now, you're going to talk to your partner. What percent of all interpersonal communication time is spent on A, people talking about how smart, special, or wonderful they are, or listening to someone do this, plus B, people talking about how stupid, inept, or bad someone else is, or listening to somebody do that? I want you to take A plus B, divide it by all communication time and give me one number. Zero is none, 100% is all. I have asked thousands of people around the world this question. I will tell you how your score compares to the average score in the whole world. Two marks, get set, 20 seconds, talk to your partner, go! Come up with a number, go, 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 go. Wow. Thank you for telling me that, because I would never know. Thank you. Okay, stop. What do you think? Stop. We have an 80. Stop. What number? 50. We have a 50, an 80. 90. 50, 80, 90. 70. 50, 80, 70, 90. 75. 85. The average answer for the whole world is about 65%. 65%. Now, everyone, everyone look up here. Do you notice these two people? You know, I talked about winning too much. Did you see what they're doing? Yes, that was my score. 
<laughs> now, I did not say that was the correct score. I just said it was the average score. There is no correct score. But it is amazing how we lapse into this ridiculous need to win, even when it makes absolutely no sense. Now, by the way, everyone look up here. How many of you given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows you everywhere you go in emails and voicemails and global economic crisis feel about as busy today as you've ever felt in your lives? I'm now going to give you a productivity enhancement tool. Reduce that number for yourselves and your teams. How much do we learn talking about how smart, special, wonderful we are? Nothing. How much do we learn talking about how dumb everybody else is? Nothing. How much of life is wasted on that? Way too much. Reduce that number for yourself and for the people on your teams. Now, enough talk. We're going to now practice something called feed forward. Before we get into this, I will share you my deepest learning as a coach. Are you ready? Here's my deepest learning as a coach. Nobody's going to get better because of me. The biggest problem for all the coaches I have is the ego of the coach. We want people to get better so we can look in the mirror and feel good about ourselves. This is not about helping others. It's about making ourselves feel important. Nobody's going to get better because of you. Have any of you ever attempted to change the behavior of a successful adult that had absolutely no interest or commitment in changing? Have any of you tried this before? And how much luck did you have in these religious conversion activities? <laughs> now, how many people in this room have ever attempted to change the behavior of a husband, wife, partner, or significant other who had absolutely no interest in changing? Come on, raise your hands. Look at her. She's looking at him. Yes, I see guilt. Yes. How many years have you been engaged in this futile behavior? Eight wasted years. <laughs> now look up here, take a deep breath. Let it go or let him go. <laughs> <One or the> other. <laughs> now let's, eight years, you're merely a beginner at stupidity. <laughs> How many people in this room have been doing this more than eight years? Come on, come on. How many years for you, sir? 30, 30 wasted years. <laughs> Can anybody top 30? How many? 50 years. Can anyone top 50? Let's hear it for the futility champion right here. 50 years. <laughs> no luck yet. You're still trying. Look up here. Take a deep breath. Oh, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Now, if you don't learn anything else from me but this lesson, you're going to be a better coach and have a happier life. I'm from a small town in Kentucky called Valley Station, Kentucky. My mother was a first grade school teacher. In my mother's mind, I was always in the first grade. <laughs> my father was in the first grade. And all of our relatives were in the first grade. My mother treated the whole world like they were six years old. She was always correcting everybody. My dad's name was Bill. She'd go, Bill, Bill, Bill. <laughs> we ended up getting a talking bird. After a while, the bird starts going, Bill, Bill, Bill. So just exactly like my mother. Now he's corrected by a bird. Old dad's 80 years old. He's on his cane. He looks up at her and he goes, Oh, honey, I'm 80 years old. Let it go. <laughs> it's been 50 years. What's the right answer? Let it go. If you don't learn anything else from me today but this little lesson, you're going to be a better coach and have a happier life. What is this lesson? If they do not care, do not waste your time. How much of our lives are wasted trying to coach people that don't care? And that time we waste with people that don't care is the one stolen from the people that do care. As a coach, you put your time and energy in with the ones that do care. Now I'm going to give you learning about developing yourself as a leader. If you do not care, do not waste your time. If you don't have your heart in it, you know what? You ain't going to get any better. And if you try to get better, you're just going to act like a phony. If you improve at anything, you know where the motivation for your improvement's got to come from? One place. You know the first thing I tell my coaching clients? You ain't getting no better because of me. Don't make this coaching process about me. You ain't getting no better because of me. I've worked with clients that have had massive improvement. I work with clients that never changed. It was the same me. The key variable in this process is not me, it's you. If you're going to get better, don't make it about me. It's not my life we're talking about, it's your life. You're going to get better because of you. Now, the client I coach that I spent the least amount of time with is the client improved the most. The client I coached that I spent the most amount of time with didn't improve at all. And in my coaching, I don't get paid if my clients don't get better client I spent the most amount of my time with, I didn't get paid. Who was dumb? Me. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Well, I learned a lesson. I talked to the client I spent the least amount of time with, who improved the most, and I can't mention his name. 
His name is Alan Mullally. Alan was the CEO of Boeing Commercial Aircraft, now he's the CEO of the Ford Motor Company. And God bless Alan, we don't have to write che tax checks for him. So yes, how do we feel about Alan? Yay for Alan, he's good. So when Alan was at Boeing, I said, Alan, of all the people I coached, I spent the least amount of time with you and you improved the most. And I said, this is humbling. I have a degree in math, I had a chart. Time spent with Marshall Goldsmith, improvement. Inc. Now I said, according to this chart, had you never met me, you would really be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked Alan, I said, Alan, what should I learn from you? He said, Marshall, the first thing you need to learn from me is your biggest job as a coach is client selection. If you pick the right clients, your process always works. You pick the wrong client, it never works. And he said, as a leader, my job isn't that different. I got to have great people. If I don't have great people, I'm not going to be real successful either. He said, the second thing you need to learn as a coach is don't make coaching about you. This wasn't about your life or your team. It was about my life and my team. And he said, leadership isn't much different. He said, for the great achiever, it's all about me. For the great leader, it's all about them. So he said, every day I go to my work, I tell myself, this is not all about me, it's all about them. Well, as a coach, you want to be a good coach, don't make it all about you. you make it all about your clients. Well, now back to feed forward. You're going to talk to your partner. And you're going to say, partner, I want you to look in your heart and pick one behavior. That if you get better at this, it's going to make a positive difference in your life. And you're going to say, partner, here's one behavior I want to get better at. And here's why I believe if I get better at this, it's going to make a positive difference in my life. Now, let's say as a result of our hour together, you only got better at one important behavior. Just one. As judged by any important group of people in your life over any significant period of time. How do I feel about our hour here, bad or good? Good. Not only are you going to have a better life, people around you are going to have a better life. When you coach others, you ought to feel the same way. Nobody's going to get perfect. Let's say you only help them get better at one important thing. It's judged by any important group over any significant period of time. How should you feel? Be proud. You made the world a little bit better. None of us can make things perfect. We can certainly make it better. Now, everybody's going to pick one behavior to improve. And it doesn't have to be anything I've discussed so far. I'll throw out a few more thought starters. Is anyone in the room impatient? Please raise your hand, impatient. She's so impatient, she was the first one to raise her hand on the impatience contest. <laughs> and would your friends and family members be sad if you became more patient or happy? The world's, and we're gonna work on that then. Okay, anybody, anybody a little stubborn or opinionated? Yes, my favorite clients in the world are stubborn and opinionated people. I, I love the stubborn and opinionated of the world. They, they keep me in business, yes. And I have good news, if we're stubborn and opinionated at work, what are the odds that we become excessively open-minded when we go home? No, this doesn't get any better, no, it, it, it's good. Uh, anybody need to listen a little better? And in the group, I noticed listening came in last place, is that correct? Listening, oh, it's third from last. The third high, Who, which one was scored the lowest? Adding too much value? Winning too much. All right, who's in the class? <laughs> Which one did you all score? The, the, what is the one that you all scored, the one you needed to improve the most? Which one was it? It was listening. Now, oh, wait a minute. You said it was listening. And you said, how many people in the class, they, it was listening, wasn't it? And then I said it was listening. What did he say? <laughs> he, he said I was confused and wrong. <laughs> did you all hear that? <laughs> Eh, well, yeah, do. I, how much? Put in twenty dollars for that terrible remark. Put in twenty. Come on, come on. You owe twenty. And, and by the way, who's the co-teacher? She agreed with him. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I thought it was listening. I was in the room, right? Obviously, when you told them it was listening, they weren't listening. <laughs> So everyone in the room is going to pick one behavior to improve. And I'm going to participate as well. My own area for improvement is I'm very extroverted. I love spending time with people. And the problem is for every person like today I'm speaking to, there are 100 people reading something I've written. And it's hard for me to sit there hour after hour by the computer and write. And it has nothing to do with money. I'm always flying on airplanes. Have any of you seen the movie um, Up in the Air? Up in the Air. He's looking for a card. Read the number in the little oval. What does the number say? 10 million miles. I have the card. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I'm always flying on the plane. Sometimes I go on an eight hour flight. I'm flying to London uh, tomorrow night. Sometimes I go on an eight hour flight. Sometimes some poor man sits next to me. 
sometimes he makes an awful mistake. He looks up and he goes, what do you do for a living? <laughs> Eight hours later, I look over the poor man and goes, <laughs> Well, great is the need of the student to learn. Greater yet is the need of the teacher to teach. My problem is not doing what I do. My problem is stopping. Now, you're going to talk to your partner. And you're going to say, partner, here's what I want to get better at. And here's why I believe if I get better at this, it's going to make a positive difference in my life. And then you say, partner, here's what I want to get better at. And here's why I believe it's going to make a positive difference in my life. Two marks. Get set. Talk to your partner. Go. Go, 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 go. The problem with everything I am teaching you today is not theory. The problem I'm teaching, every, everything I'm teaching you today is execution. Everything I'm teaching you today is very easy to understand and very hard to do. When you read this book, you might be tempted to laugh at the stories and say, what a bunch of silly people. How could they be so goofy? Well, these goofy, silly people have IQs of 150 and they're CEOs of multi-billion dollar companies. They'll all tell you one thing. This stuff is easy to understand. It's hard to do. I'll give you an example. When my book was the number one ranked business book in the, in the whole United States, this book, the number one ranked diet book in the whole United States sold 10 times as many copies. Americans get fatter and fatter and fatter and fatter and buy more and more diet books. If buying diet books would make you thin, Americans would be the thinnest people in the history of the world. <laughs> no one loses weight because they buy a diet book. You actually have to go on the diet. <laughs> now, I made a mistake with this book, a terrible mistake. I love the title, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. If I had to write the book over, I should have changed the title. You know what I should have named this book? What Got You Here Won't Get You There, Diet. Then I would have really sold a lot of copies. <laughs> now you're going to talk to your partner. And you're going to say, partner, here is what I said I wanted to get better at. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do to try to get better. Give me one or two ideas so when I leave this room, I really do it. She's going to give you one or two ideas. What if she gives you the dumbest idea in the whole world? What do you say to her? Thank you. And you say, partner, here's what I want to get better at. Here's what I want to try to do. Please give me one or two ideas. And you say, thank you. Two marks, get set, talk to your partners. Go, 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 go. Stop and say thank you to your partner. Thank you. Thank you, partner. Thank you. Now, now there is one thing I left out, a fun technique called using small amounts of money to create large changes in behavior. A very counterintuitive technique, shocking how well this works. Very counterintuitive. Not what you would expect at all. And let's guess, most of my personal coaching clients, let's guess, would they be women, do you think, or mostly men? Men, yes. Would they be younger or a tad older? Would they be the poor or the very rich? A bunch of rich old men. <laughs> yes, a bunch of rich old men. I was teaching this class and one woman raised her hand and she goes, any single ones, right? <laughs> That's what you were thinking. <laughs> well, there's a common misperception about rich old men. That is, rich old men would not mind losing tiny little amounts of money. That would be wrong. Rich old men hate losing any money. Watch them play golf. They play golf for $5. They lie. They cheat. They swear at each other. Now, it's amazing how well this works. I'm just going to give you two quick ways I use this. One is called destructive comments. I teach people, if you ever make another destructive comment about a person or group, find people a dollar or $20 or whatever it is, and they have to pay. And it is amazing how well this works. How many of you work in companies that preach this sermon? We want to create an environment where people reach out across the company. Reach out. We want to build positive, synergistic, win-win relationships with our colleagues. Do we like these silos? No, we do not like the silos. We must tear down those terrible silos. How many of you work in companies that preach this stuff? What happens to all this corporate happy talk when we stab our colleagues in the back? It doesn't make it better. It's worse. A bad habit. A bad habit. Now, starting now, one, how many people in the room have made at least one unnecessary destructive comment about another person or group in the last month that we should not have made? That's everyone. Take one dollar out and put it on the ground in front of you. 
Take it. And if you don't have a dollar, borrow it from your coach. If your coach does not have a dollar, borrow it from your neighbors. Put a dollar on the ground. Borrow it. Borrow it. Find a dollar. If you don't have a dollar, find a dollar. Give her a dollar. The woman needs a dollar. Raise your hand if you do not have a dollar, right? This woman doesn't have a dollar. Thank you. Put the dollar on the ground. Now, everyone look up here. Everyone look up here. Who has a wonderful charity, a nice cause you'd like to raise some money for? Raise your hand. Up, oh, first hand. And, and do these kids need the money more than people in this room? And your first name is? So let's hear it for Sonia. Yay! Yay for Sonia. Now, we're going to raise some money for these kids at the YMCA, Sonia. So we'll raise a few bucks. Start. Yes, very good. And by the way, Gary's in for a 20 for his previous sin. So he's, he's already put in a 20. And she's in for a 10. Very good. Okay, now, let me see. He's in for a 20. I don't want to steal the 20. So here's the 20, right? Now, starting now, if anybody makes a destructive comment, just say $1. And it's amazing how well this works. One of my clients, I, I love getting emails. I can't answer the emails immediately, but I always get back to people eventually. You sent me an email before. I got back to you, didn't I? I get back to people eventually. Well, one of my clients sent me an email. And she said, my, I have two teen, teenagers. They're so negative. I'm going to do this with my kids. One dollar fine for every destructive comment. And to be a good role model, ten dollars for mommy and daddy. She sent me an email six months later. I am amazed how much more positive my children have become. I am ashamed how much money my husband and I have lost. <laughs> See, she was good at seeing this problem where? In the kids. What she didn't realize, where were the kids picking this up? From her and her husband. Yeah. So this is a good one. Starting now, somebody makes a destructive comment on your team, just charge, charge everybody a dollar and give the money to charity. How much money have I raised for charity playing these games with my clients over the years? Over $450,000. And it doesn't hurt anybody. Now this next one is great for stubborn people. How many people in the world, in the room, are a little stubborn or opinionated? A little stubborn. Now, why did you pat him on the shoulder? Because we were sharing about Ah, oh, you were. Good. Okay. Yeah, you're a little stubborn, right? This is good. Oh, look, she's smiling. Right. Did you come with him? I don't know. If I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> is he a little stubborn? No, I can get around it. You, know, you can get around it. Okay, she can get around it. Good. Years of experience, I can tell. Smarter, smarter. Now, this is great for stubborn, opinionated people. Starting now, a $1 fine if you begin any sentence with three words. No, but, or however. Now, by the way, Gary, did the class that I just worked with, did they get to read the book beforehand? Yes. And then they asked me questions. How did you all do on this no but however thing? Was it an, was it an impressive performance or underwhelming? No, it was, pretty, it was pretty bad, wasn't it, right? I was just charging money constantly here. Well, this is hard. One of my clients is stubborn and opinionated. If people talk to us, the first word about this, no, what would we just say? You're wrong. What's but mean? Disregard everything you said. However, it's a fancy word for but. Terrible habit. One of my clients is stubborn. I'm reviewing his feedback report. He says, but Marshall, I said, that's free. If you ever start a sentence with no, but, or however, I'm going to fine you $20. He says, but Marshall, 20. <laughs> no, 40. No, 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 60, 80, 100. He lost $420 in an hour and a half. What did he say at the end of the hour and a half? Thank you. Thank you. By the way, my newest client, I've spent so far about five hours with him, he's already lost $560. It is amazing. We don't hear ourselves doing this. Well, the gentleman that lost $420 in an hour and a half, he said, thank you. He said, I had no idea. How many times would I have done that had you not been throwing it in my face? I did it 21 times with you throwing it in my face. How many times would I have done it had you not been throwing it in my face? 50? 100? No wonder people think I'm stubborn. The first thing I do when someone speaks to me is I prove they're wrong or I know more than them or they're confused or something over and over and over. This guy got so much better just learning this. <laughs> we don't ask this question because we're afraid of the answers. Get in the habit of asking this question. When we ask, we set up an expectation. What should people think we should do next? Listen. And the first thing we want to do is the last thing we should. What's that? Express my opinion. It is very hard to ask for input and not start expressing our own opinion. Ask, listen. The next thing is think. 
Think about what people are saying and fight that urge to talk back. Fight that urge to speak, especially if we're angry. Just ask, listen, think. Thank people. Now, the next thing is don't punish the messenger. Now, I'm going to try another audience response test. You all didn't do real well on that last one. It was a paltry results. Maybe we'll do better on this time. Mm, or not. Are we ready? Yes. The answer is yes. You must say yes. Are we ready? Yes. In your company, are employees important? Yes. Should we ask the employees for opinions? Yes. Should the employees be encouraged to express their opinions? Yes. Is punishing the messenger a bad thing? Yes. Is it a very bad thing? I believe I'm in a room filled with hypocrites. I'm now going to give you a case study on punishing messengers, and I predict massive failure. Are you ready? Yes. You have a hard day at work, a hard day. You come home. Your husband, wife, significant other, or partner is there. You get in the car to drive to the store. Lots of traffic. Cars are cutting in front of you. People are honking their horns. The person in the front seat goes, Look out! There's a red light up ahead! Did you say... Thank you. <laughs> or perhaps something that sounded a little more like, what do you mean there's a red light up ahead? Don't you think I can see? I know how to drive the car. Why don't you be quiet and let me drive? How many of us have ever chosen option B before? <laughs> I'm very confused. Didn't you say punishing the messenger was bad? You're a hypocrite, aren't you? What was the cost of that person saying, hey, there's a red light up ahead? What did that cost? Nothing. What could that have saved? Your life, their life, and the lives of other innocent people. If someone gives us something that has a fantastic potential benefit and costs nothing. What should we say to this fine person? And the next time you're driving along and that person corrects your driving, what are you going to say? <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Thank you. Ask, listen, thank. Now, the next thing is respond. Do all of you know the term 360-degree feedback? Yes, I'm a pioneer in the world of 360-degree feedback, a pioneer, a dubious adjective, pioneer. Yes, last year I won the, the wonderful Lifetime Achievement Award for the Institute for Management Studies. What does that award mean? He must be almost dead. <laughs> Followed, all I have left to strive for now is the coveted memorial trophy, right? <laughs> well, I don't know much about much, but I know a lot about how to respond to three feedback. If you ever get 360 feedback or teach others about it, all you need to remember, positive, simple, focused, and fast. You're my coworker. I'd say, Miss Coworker, we're going through this 360 feedback process, and I just want to say thanks to everyone who participated. I don't know who said what. I just want to say how grateful I am to everyone who took the time. I know you're busy. I have nothing to lose and much to gain. Second, Miss Coworker, much of my feedback is positive, ethical, dedicated, hardworking, caring about the company and our customers. These are important things to me. I'd hope mine score high and did. I want to say how grateful I am. And don't say but. Say and or something I'd like to improve. My advice, pick one. Don't pick a laundry list. Just pick one thing. You're not going to change 50 things anyway. In the past, I've come off as stubborn, opinionated, trying to be right. If I've done that to you or the people around you, I'm sorry. Please accept my apologies. No excuse. We all make mistakes. What should we do when we make a mistake? Apologize. And if we feel like blaming somebody, who's the best person to blame? I wrote an article in Fast Company about this called To Help Others Develop, Start With Yourself. The best thing you can do as a leader to help others get better, let them watch you try to get better. Take responsibility for yourself. Then the next part is don't ask for more feedback about the past. Ask for ideas. Miss Coworker, I can't change the past. I'm not going to ask you for feedback about the past. I'm going to ask you for ideas for the future. If you had to have ideas to help me be a positive and open-minded listener in the future, what would they be? Sit there, shut up, listen, take notes, and say thank you. Don't judge or critique. Then I'd say, you know, I can't promise to do everything people say. By the way, leadership is not a popularity contest. We can't do everything people suggest. I'd say I can't promise to do everything you and everyone suggest. I can promise to listen to everyone to think of all the ideas and do what I can. I cannot change the past. I can change the future. I cannot get better at everything. I can certainly get better at one thing. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to help me get better at that. How much time did that take? Pfft, seconds. Ask, listen, respond, involve that other person. Now, change. And the key to making everything I teach you today work is you have to follow up. What's follow up sound like? This coworker, two months ago, I said I wanted to be a more positive and open-minded listener. Based on the last two months, give me ideas for the next two. 
It's been four months, six months. What happens if you do this? I'll answer this not from a theory point of view, but from a research point of view. It's a study, by the way, I have a website. My website's called www.marshallgoldsmithlibrary.com. Have any of you been to my website? I give everything away. All my material you can copy, share, download, duplicate, use in church, charity, business, any way you want to. I don't care. And so you can look up this exact study if you would like to. Johnson & Johnson did a cross-cultural study. They were one of the eight companies. No country in the world, this didn't work. Worked everywhere in the world. What did we learn in our research? The corporations were in totally different industries, made absolutely no difference. Uh, everybody got multi-rater feedback and they were asked to talk to a consultant and do what I did with you and follow up. What did we learn? When people said my coworker did no follow up, improvement looked slightly better than random chance. Might as well have been watching sitcoms. When people said my coworker did a little follow up, a little better. Some follow up a lot better. Frequent follow up, much better. And finally, consistent or periodic follow up, massive improvement. 86,000 people, eight major corporations. These people all went to the same programs, got feedback on the same process. You know what I learned? If my clients get better, it doesn't have much to do with me. It's got to do with them. It was the same me. This stuff works. It just doesn't work if you don't do it. Now, I'm going to finish with my favorite coaching exercise in the world. And for those of you who would like to stick around, I'm going to be happy to do a little bit of extra for those who like to stick around. I'll do an extra 10 minutes or so and be happy and let go of guilt. That part is particularly good for women, by the way. Um, I was asked a question, are there differences in leadership feedback between women and men? And there are. The average woman in 360 feedback is seen as as good or better as a leader than the average man. The average woman has one issue to deal with much more than the average man, the desire to be the perfect everything to everyone. The one issue I deal with women a lot more than men is guilt. With women, I'm much more likely to say, please don't be so hard on yourself. Don't be so hard on yourself. Men, look up here. Yes, men, there are learnings for us in this stupid and unfortunate Center for Creative Leadership Research. Yes, men, there's a little bad news for us in this research. Yet, men, for us, there's, there's good news. First, men, for us, the bad news, according to the dumb Center for Creative Leadership, the bad news is, as leaders, let's face it, we're not as good. The good news is, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to feel now it all makes sense, right? You were confused before. <laughs> Oh, now, we're going we're gonna to finish with my favorite coaching exercise in the whole world. You're now going to get the best advice you're ever going to get. And then I'm going to wrap up. If people would like to stick around, ask questions, whatever you can, and the rest of the people can take off. Are you ready? Take a, take a deep breath. Ah, take a deeper breath. I want you to imagine that you're 95 years old, and you're just getting ready to die. You're on that deathbed. Here comes your last breath. Ah, but right before you take that breath, you're given a wonderful gift, the ability to go back in time. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person in this room. The ability to help this person be a better leader. Much more important, the ability to help this person have a better life. What advice would the wise 95-year-old you, who knows what was really important and what was not, what matters and what does not? What counts and what does not? What advice would that wise person have for the you that is sitting in this room? I do not want you to say anything or do anything or write anything. Answer two questions in your mind. Question number one, professional advice. That person wants you to be a great coach, a great leader, a great professional. What professional advice would that old person have for you? Number two, personal advice. That old person wants you to have a great life. What personal advice would that old person have for you? Whatever you're thinking now, do that. A friend of mine interviewed old folks who were dying. Got to ask him this question, what advice would you have? Three themes come up in the answers from old people facing death. Theme number one could be summarized in three words. Be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Be happy now. The great Western disease, I will be happy when. 
when I get the status, the money, the BMW, the condominium, I will be happy when. We all have exactly the same when. This building is named after a nice woman named Joan Crock. She was one of my neighbors in Fairbanks Ranch. We were driving by her house with my friend Lisa. Lisa looked up the big hill and said, Joan Crock, well, she has everything. All that money and billions of dollars and that huge house and the fancy view. I wish I could trade places with Joan Crock. I said, Lisa, go knock on the door and say, Joan, you are 74. I am 24. You give me all that stuff, I will give you 50 years. What do you think Joan Crock would be saying? Sold. You do not want to trade with her. She wants to trade with you. Joan Crock is dead now. She's not dead. Bad trade. Don't get so wrapped up looking at what you do not have. You miss what you do have. People in this room are among the luckiest people in the history of the world. Try not to get so wrapped up looking at what you don't have, you forget about that. Uh, I've asked thousands of parents around the world this question. When my child grows up, I want my child to be. Give me one word. One word comes up from parents. One word, no matter what country I am in, more than every other word combined. Happy. You want your children to be happy? You want your parents to be happy? Do you want the people who love you to be happy? Do you want the people who respect you at work to be happy? You go first. You go first. They want you to be happy. Learning point number two, friends and family. Many of you work in wonderful companies. I'm going to help you. When you're 95 years old and you're on that deathbed and you go looking around the room, very few fellow employees are going to be waving goodbye. (laughs) You start to realize these friends and family are kind of important. They're the only ones who seem to care today. And learning point three, if you have a dream, go for it. Because if you don't go for it when you're 25, you may not when you're 35 or 55 or 85. It doesn't have to be a big one, maybe a little one. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish, play a guitar. Other people may think your dream is goofy. Who cares? Not their dream. It's your dream. It's not their life. It's your life. Old people who try to achieve their dreams are always happier with their lives. None of us are going to achieve our dreams. If we do, we just make up new ones. The key is not, did I achieve my dream? The key is, did I at least try? Business advice isn't different. Number one, have fun. Life is short. Life is short. Number two, people. Do whatever you can to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason is a 95-year-old you will be proud of you because you did and disappointed if you don't. And the final advice is also the same. Go for it. Your industries are changing. The world's changing. You do what you think is right. Might not win. At least you can say, I tried. Old people almost never regret the risks they took and failed. They almost always regret the risks they failed to take. Final thing I'd like to say is I had a great time working with everybody. I'm going to stick around for those of you who'd like to stick around for everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.